Paul's greetings for Christmas. Last Sunday morning, we gave a companion message to the one this morning. Last Sunday morning, it was Paul's gospel for Christmas. And at that time, we saw that faith is factual. This morning, we're going to see that faith is functional likewise. This is the time of the year when friends send greetings to friends. Many people send Christmas cards who never write any other time of the year. And that's the most wonderful time of the year to call to mind friends who are down in your subconscious mind, but you haven't thought of them for a year. And you open up and read the card and say, oh my, I'd forgotten all about Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, and here's a lovely card from them. Now, this custom of sending Christmas cards is comparatively of recent origin. It's really a new innovation. The one who began this was a young boy, 16 years of age, by the name of Max Egley, back in 1842. He designed and etched the first Christmas card. That card is on display today in the British Museum. It was in England, of course. And this custom has grown. This young boy lived to be 90 years of age, and he saw that become a universal custom. Now, this year, the number of Christmas cards have reached such a staggering proportions that there are those that are suggesting that this custom now should be abandoned, that we should give it up, that we should no longer send Christmas cards. In other words, one more card may be the straw that will break the mailman's back. And this movement today to cease sending Christmas cards, you may be sure, is not sponsored by the Hallmark Card Company. They are not the ones that are back of it. But there is a definite movement today that we leave this off, this custom off. Now, granted this morning that the sending of cards can become ridiculous in many cases. I heard of a credit store back east that sent out its Christmas cards to its customers, put on the card, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But in some of the cards, they put a notice. If you do not make your next payment on your TV or whatnot, why, we'll be out to get it, and you won't have a Merry Christmas. May I say that that's really carrying the Christmas card to that which is the ultimate, the ultra, the ridiculous. Even today, smutty cards with evil suggestions are freely exchanged. And, of course, when that's done, the entire intent and purpose of sending and receiving cards is missed altogether. Now, you may be interested to know that this custom of sending greetings is as old as the church itself. It's as old as Christianity. It goes back to the apostolic church, and you will find the apostles sending greetings. Paul, in the 16th chapter of Romans, I read a portion of that this morning, is one of those chapters where he sends greetings, personal greetings, to saints that are yonder in Rome. You'll find the same thing in the 4th chapter of Colossians, and there are other places in the Scripture where greetings were sent by the early church, by one member or an apostle to the members of a church. And they didn't confine it, of course, to what we call the Christmas season. Actually, it was a greeting for all the year, an all-occasion card, if you please. Remember the Scotchman, when he sent out his Christmas cards, he put on it, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and he also put on it, Happy Easter, Big Fourth of July, and also a Happy Thanksgiving. 
He let one card do the work. Well, may I say that's what the early church did. That's what Paul is doing here. He's sending a greeting that is for any season and every season of the year. In Romans 16, we have a list of those who received greetings from Paul in Rome. And this is one of the most intriguing chapters in the entire Word of God. May I say that it's like taking a page out of the Lamb's Book of Life when you take up this chapter here and read it of saints that to you and me today are just names. We do not know them personally. However, I hope this morning we will get acquainted with a few of them that are mentioned here. There are 36 persons mentioned in this chapter by name. They are identified for us here in this chapter. Twenty-eight of them were then and there in Rome, and the others either visited Rome before or after Paul wrote this epistle. These people that are mentioned here, friends, were believers like you and I in the early church. They walked the dark side streets of pagan Rome. They strolled along its wide boulevards that was decorated and graced by heathen temples. They traveled the highways protected by Roman soldiers. They traversed the seas that were ruled by Rome. And it was at a time when mad Nero and cruel Claudius and those of their ilk were on the throne. And these folks, felt the pressure and the pinchers of persecution for being Christians in their day. You have these that, even in spite of all of their hardships, they experience fullness of joy. My friend, may I say to you this morning that chapter 16 of Romans is the gospel in shoe leather. Do you want to know whether Christianity worked in the first century? Well, here they are. Men and women, just like you and I are this morning, and here are the things that are mentioned concerning them. These had come to a knowledge of the Savior who had come into the world. It had transformed their lives, and they were new creatures in Christ Jesus. They knew something about Rome. All of them did. Idolatry and immorality ran rife and held sway in that day, but these folk lived triumphant lives for Christ. They were faithful witnesses for him. They were all active in Christian service. It was a time when it was a holiday for sin. High carnival, lust was unbridled in that day, and these folk lived separated and holy lives under God. Here, my beloved, is a walking demonstration that the doctrines that Paul the Apostle enunciated were more than just theoretical talks. This reveals that it was more than philosophical fiction. Here is the evidence that the creed of the early church led to conduct in the lives of men and women. This chapter is very practical. This is something that can be incorporated into individual lives. This is something that can be translated into shoe leather, if you please. And this is a Christmas when we need to see Christmas not on a card, but in the lives and hearts of men and women. Now, my beloved, we see that faith rests upon facts. Last Sunday morning... I think it's obvious that we made it clear that Paul believed in the virgin birth. And that was essential. In order to become a Christian, that's what you had to accept. In order to know that he's who he is, the Son of God, the Savior of the world with power to save, he must be virgin born. That he lived and died 
and was buried and was raised again, ascended into heaven, and even this morning after 1900 years, he is at God's right hand. Faith rests upon facts. These are the facts of the Christian faith. But faith is functional also. It's as utilitarian as an old rocking chair on a front porch. It's something that works. It's something that has an application to life, not only in the first century, but life today. It reveals that Paul and James were together when James said, faith with works is a lie, and that if you can show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. And Paul says, I want you to see that the faith that I've been writing about works, and that it is in the lives and hearts of men and women. Paul opened this epistle by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. This man who out yonder in the hinterland had made such an impression that they were talking about him in Rome, but the skeptics were saying, his critics were saying, he won't come to Rome. He's afraid to come here and meet real opposition. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And the reason it is, he opens the epistle by saying, it is the gospel of God. He's the originator of it. It came from heaven, and it has power to transform hearts and lives. That's important to know. In the play Green Pastures, which is a blasphemous thing, there is a scene in a cotton patch in Mississippi. And you find those that were picking the cotton, they're weary and tired. They lie down on their cotton sacks. And there stands up in their midst one, a colored preacher, who preaches the gospel to them and gives them this verse, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll rest you. And one tired, weary soul lifts himself up, and he says, Them's good words, but who said them? It makes a lot of difference who said them. It makes all the difference in the world who said them. May I say to you this morning that Christianity is something that's come from God and one of the great proofs of it is yonder in the first century and now for 19 centuries this gospel has worked in the hearts and lives of men and women. That's one of the great proofs that it's come from God. So Paul here sends a greeting. He sends Christmas greetings, if you please, to the church in Rome. And he opened by saying to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Now in the last chapter, he takes them up by name and mentions them by name. And what we have here is a recognition. We have an appreciation. We have an encouragement an expression on Paul's part concerning these saints. Now, before we lift out several of them this morning, there are several striking features about this chapter, and I'd like to call your attention to two of them. The first is this, and it's a question that naturally arises. How did Paul know these saints so intimately? in view of the fact he had never visited Rome up to this time. When Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans, he'd never been in Rome, and yet the folk that he mentions here by name, he knew every one of them. How did that happen? Well, I think that this is one of the lovely things about the entire epistle. It's this. Rome was like a planet. And it had tremendous power of gravity, of pulling men and women from the far corners of the empire into its great center, the capital. That great cosmopolitan center of Rome drew men and women from everywhere. They all came into that center. 
It had, it had the power of gravity. Just like this morning, there is a four-ton satellite that man had put up yonder about 400 miles right now going around this earth. It won't go any farther because of the fact that the earth has the power to hold, and it is holding it down this morning. Isn't it interesting? Man has the power to put it up yonder and even put the voice of the president saying, Peace on earth, goodwill to man, but the president and men today don't have power to bring peace into this world. The very thing they need power for, they don't have. That's the reason Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That gospel has more power than that satellite has today. But this little earth is holding that satellite this morning. Rome had a way of drawing in. It was a great center, the center of culture, the center of education, the center of politics, the center of business. Everything had to be cleared through Rome. It was the New York City. It was the Washington. It was the London. It was the Paris of that day. It was everything. Out yonder in the hinterland when Paul went around preaching the gospel and there were those who came to Christ, some of them were drawn to Rome like one of these days that four-turn satellite will make a swan dive back to this earth. It won't stay there. It'll be coming back. And so... These folks, some of them, gave way, and that tremendous power drew them to Rome. And so in a period of time, there came into the city of Rome a group of people that Paul had led to Christ. And I think when they met each other, that one said to the other, I see you're a Christian, and you didn't say that too loud in those days. It cost you something. And they said, yes. And where were you converted? I was way up yonder in the Galatian country, in a little place called Lystra. A man by the name of Paul the, Apo Paul the Apostle. I was in Ephesus when he came there, and a third man said, You know, I was in Philippi. Did you hear about his experience in Philippi? It was in Philippi that I came to Christ. And then they all came together, and actually... Peter didn't found the church in Rome. He never even went there. There is not one historical record that shows Peter ever went to Rome. Paul founded the church in Rome by remote control, by leading men and women to Christ who gravitated to Rome, and then they came together, and it's to this group that Paul is writing this marvelous epistle. That's the thing that this chapter reveals. The second thing is this. It's the prominence of women in this chapter. The first two women that are mentioned are the first two people that are mentioned in the chapter are women. The fact of the matter is there are about seven, probably more, that are here. There's a question about some of the names, but at least there's seven women that are mentioned here by name. That was Phoebe. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Santria. Santria was the port of Corinth. It's like San Pedro is to Los Angeles. She lived in San Pedro of that day. And Phoebe was a prominent woman. I have a notion she was either a widow or a maiden lady. She was a good businesswoman. She had come to Christ. And when she did, she didn't change her pagan name. Phoebe means bright. It was the name that the Greeks had given to the moon. They called it Artemis. Diana was another name, and Phoebe. 
She never changed her name. The early church never thought it was necessary to change your name just so you change your life. And that was the thing that was important. And so Phoebe was a prominent woman in the early church, and she held an official position. Now, those of you that think I'm very hard on women in the church, will you listen to me now? She had an official position in the early church, and I do not know why the translators here call her a servant when that word is translated deacon elsewhere. She was a deaconess in the early church. That was obviously an office in the early church. We today have two extreme positions. One position is, held by some, that a woman is to be silent in the church and never say or do a thing. And then there's another extreme, the opposite, that says women ought to be preachers. I want to say I disagree with both groups. I do not think either one is accurate. I'm not sure we are accurate today. I'm confident the Protestant churches have missed it. May I say this? That this was an office in the early church, that of deaconess, same as deacon. And because of that, a great many scriptures were taken and said women are to keep silent in the church. I think there's evidence that women taught. I think they taught women. There's evidence that they gave their testimony. I think when Phoebe got to Rome, she gave her testimony to the church. It's obvious they prayed publicly in the church. Paul never said they were not to pray publicly. He said they are to pray with their head covered. That's all he said, which means that they are to pray. So that women occupied a prominent place in the early church, in fact, an official position. And I believe today that the two extreme positions have put the church in a very awkward position. One position says they're to be preachers, which, of course, they're not. The other position says they're to stay out of all official positions, which is wrong. They are to be deaconesses. They ought to be, in every church today, a board known as the board of the deaconesses. What conceit on the part of men to think that they are the ones to run the church today. May I say to you that there should be that board. They should not be on other boards but they should have a board of their own, deacons, that obviously was in the early church. And isn't this a lovely chapter? The first two persons mention a women who were active in the early church, and then there are others. I like this one, Greet Mary. <laughs> I don't knew not know who that Mary was, but she sure was active in the church in Rome. She wasn't worshipped in the church in that day. She was just active in the church in that day. What a picture you have here. Now I wonder if I may lift out of these 36 today just a few, and very briefly today, who were co-laborers with the Apostle Paul. Let me mention the ones we want to look at. Priscilla and Aquila, companions of Paul. We want to look at Epinetus, a convert of the Holy Spirit. And third, we want to look at Rufus, chosen of the Lord. These are the three. We want to look, first of all, at Priscilla and Aquila. They were companions of Paul. Will you listen to this language? Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church which is in their house. Now, this couple is a couple that we probably have more on than any other two. In fact, of the matter is, we have a complete file on these two that are given to us here. Priscilla and Aquila. They were the helpers of Paul. And I think it'll be interesting this morning to go back and find out where Paul first met them. Will you listen as I read now Acts, the 18th chapter, the first verse? Listen to this. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. He's on his second missionary journey. 
And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now here is a couple, a remarkable couple, if you please. Aquila, for instance, was born in Pontus, way over by the Black Sea. And there must have been a tremendous movement of businessmen in that day, for that young man did not want to stay way out yonder in the country where he was born. He came to Rome. And the first thing you know, he has a department store. He's a tent maker. But there came to the throne Claudius. And over the world there rolled, as there has rolled many times, a wave of anti-Semitism. And Claudius made a ruling that every Jew would have to leave Rome. You see, the thing Hitler did, Mussolini did, and now Russia's doing right now, by the way, is not new at all. It's as old as this world itself. It's as old as the Jew is. He's been hated in this world. And so they had to leave Rome. And this couple, their business folk, they went over to Corinth and they opened up a department store there. (laughs) That was Bullock's Pasadena they opened up there. And it was while they were there that there came to town a little fella that they thought at first was a tent maker. In fact, they met him, but they went down to the synagogue, and lo and behold, he spoke down at the synagogue. He told them something new. He told them about one, Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. Told about how he'd come among them, how he was the son of God for the virgin birth, how he died upon a cross for their sin, how he was buried and raised again, and how he'd gone back to heaven. You know what happened? Priscilla and Aquila accepted Christ as Savior and invited Paul in. They became very friendly. When Paul went over a little later to Ephesus, in the meantime, they left Corinth. The Bullocks and Pasadena done so well. They went on over to Ephesus and they opened up Bullocks Santa Ana over there. And that's the way they were moving, you see. In the meantime, Claudius, die. And so I think that Dr. Godet is right when he says about two years elapsed, and then Quill and Priscilla returned to Rome. Paul had been with them. And now when they return to Rome, you have this lovely thing. Paul, first ones he mentions, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. They were my helpers. Did you notice that? They were my helpers. There are many folk that are saying this morning, right here in this wonderful congregation, I have no gift from God. I can't preach. I'm not called as a missionary. I'm not called to sing. I can't sing. Therefore, I have no gift, and that means I can't do anything. May I say that every one of you has got a gift. Many of you have the gift of Aquila and Priscilla apparently don't know it. Will you notice what it is? In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing. And here's one they all pass over. Helps, helps, helps. Paul says that these were my helpers in the Lord. Some of you have the gift of helps. There's someone here today that they don't know it even this morning, but they're responsible for us going on in TV. They encouraged us and then they gave a gift and we were encouraged to go on. You see, that's a gift, friend, the gift of helps. Paul says... Won't you remember these two, this lovely couple? They were my helpers. That was their gift. They never preached. They never went as missionaries. They were business people. They ran department stores. But they helped the apostle Paul. And Paul says, I want you to greet them. 
And the thing that interests me is this, that when we first meet them, they are Aquila and Priscilla, and now when we come to the end, they are Priscilla and Aquila now. They were Aquila and Priscilla at first. Looks like she got ahead. May I say to you that the dominant one in the family was Priscilla. I think she probably had the business head also. Anyway, she's the one now that is dominant, and that happens many times today. And my, how God will use a wonderful couple like this. Now let me move on. The next one I come to that I want to look at today is Epinetus. In verse 5, likewise greet the church that's in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who's the first fruits of Achaia under Christ. And the second one Paul mentioned is this man Epinetus. He was the first convert in the province of Asia. Now, Paul went to Ephesus with fear and trembling. Satan's headquarters was in Ephesus. It was the most difficult place that Paul had to minister. May I say this? That Corinth filled with immorality was not difficult. Actually, Athens filled with culture was not difficult. And Rome, filled with political power, was not difficult for Paul. But Ephesus was hard. Do you know why? It was the religious capital of both East and West. There was more religion in Ephesus than anything else, and Paul had trouble with religion. They almost mobbed him. They almost ran him out of town. But God gave him an open door, a marvelous open door. He said to the Corinthians that a great and effectual door is opened unto me, but there are many adversaries. And from the school of Tyrannus, where he had a preaching point, Paul sounded out the gospel that went throughout Asia. And if you want a profitable pastime, go through the New Testament and find the ones that came to know Christ through the ministry of the Apostle Paul during those two years. Did you know Philemon came to know Christ? He was down to Ephesus on business trip and went by to hear him. <laughs> he came to know Christ. May I say to you, my friend, today that many came to know Christ because of his ministry there for two years. And the very first one was Epinetus. And Epinetus up and moved to Rome. Now Paul says, I want you to greet him second. He's second on my Christmas list. I want you to greet this brother because he came to know Christ. But you notice Paul doesn't count his converts. If Paul says that's the work of the Holy Spirit, I preached the gospel and the Holy Spirit did the rest, and he's a convert of the Holy Spirit. I turn briefly to this last one, Rufus. (laughs) Rufus. Verse 13, will you notice Rufus? Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. It says he's chosen of the Lord. Now, personally, this man seems to stand in the shadows in this chapter. We feel like we can't know more much about him. I think we know a great deal about him. I can even tell you the color of his hair this morning. You can't do that with very many in the Bible, but I can tell you the color of this man's hair. I want now Rufus to step into the spotlight. And if he were in Los Angeles today, I'm confident that sometime we'd work him in on the person of the week on our TV program. I'd love to have Rufus on sometime. Great saint of God. Do you know what his name means? Red. It's his name. He had red hair. That's his name, Rufus, Red. Everybody called him Red. But the interesting thing is that there were a lot of red-headed people, and you call a man Red today, that certainly doesn't distinguish him. A fellow called me up some time ago and said, my name is Red. He says, this is Red. I said, Red who? My, there are a lot of Red. And this man, that's all that you've got. It's just red. You can change it to that. And somebody says, well, he's chosen of the Lord. I love that. 
He's chosen in a special way because all of these are chosen of the Lord. You could say that of all. And some think that this should be translated, he's distinguished of the Lord. In other words, only one is outstanding. That's Ray. Yeah. These others are wonderful saints, but one is outstanding, and that happens to be red here. Now, will you notice that we can know something about him? When John Mark wrote his gospel, he wrote it to the Romans, and he says something that has always been a mystery. He mentions the fact that a man by the name of Simon, a Cyrenian, carried the cross of Christ and here's what he says in Mark 15, 21, And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear the cross. You see, John Mark was writing to Rome, and he knew all the saints over at Rome would know Rufus, because he was outstanding in the church. And now when he wrote this, he says, I want you to know about this man, Simon, he's a Cyrenian, swarthy complexion, the Roman soldiers there that day saw Jesus falling under the cross, and they looked around and said, here, that great big double-fisted fella, Simon of Cyrene, he says, you come here and carry it, and he carried it, and he, I tell you, has become immortal because of that. It's on the Lamb's book of life because he got under that cross. But that's not all the story. He's the father of Rufus. Rufus. And that's not all Paul says about him. Will you notice? Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Now we know nothing of the mother of Paul the apostle. We know nothing of his father. But there was in the city of Jerusalem a godly woman who was the wife of Simon who carried the cross. And she was like a mother, I think, to many. A lot of women have that gift. And she was like a mother to the apostle Paul. You see, when Paul first came to Jerusalem, they were afraid of him after his conversion. They, we're not sure of this fellow. He may be tricking us. He may not be genuine, and they were afraid of him. But this mother of Rufus, and she just took him, took Paul in. She said, you just come in and stay with Rufus in his room. She said, she is his mother, but she's mine too. She was like a mother to me. What a lovely thing to say. Now Rufus is off yonder in Rome. And we know today that Rufus was, Red was the name given to many slaves. In fact, it was such a common name a few years ago that when they went down the Appian Way, they found a grave, and on it was the name Rufus, and they thought they had found this man here. But listen, they found hundreds of graves with red, just red written on it. That's all. That's the only designation, no even first name or last name, just red. All you know about him, he's a red-headed fellow. But Paul said something, chosen of the Lord. A common slave by the name of Rufus. But God saw fit to put his name down in his word and said he's chosen of the Lord. Somebody says, I see you're bringing up this awful doctrine of election. No, I'm not. I want to say something to you this morning. I hope it'll mean as much to you as it means to me. I have news for you. Your name is in this book today. And there's greetings that have come from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to you personally. Your name is you. You say, I've been through the Bible. My name's not there. One night, cold night in London, a little girl with her little brother, cold and shivering, stepped inside one of the Church of England. It was warm. They were having a service. 
And the man up was reading the scripture. They stood there, just not only getting warm, but thrilled. They'd never been in a church before, this little girl and her little brother. And after the service, when everybody had left, the little girl went up to the rector. She said to him, Sir, I never knew my name was in the Bible. And he said, little girl, what is your name? She says, my name is Edith. Oh, he says, you must be mistaken. Your name is not in the Bible. She said, yes, it is, sir. I heard you read tonight. Did you read my name tonight? Well, he says, I think there's some mistake here. How do you mean that your name's in the Bible? Oh, she said, you read tonight that Jesus receiveth sinners and eateth with them. My name's in the Bible. The rector thought a moment and he said, maybe you're right. Maybe it is in the Bible. Yours is in the Bible this morning. You say, where is it in the Bible? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, that's you, that's you. Oh, somebody says it's not me. Yes, it is you. Somebody says, but what about election? You are the one that makes the choice. When you choose him, he chooses you. That's all I know today. He's never let me see his side of the ledger. He says, whosoever means you, and you, and you. It's his greeting to you. You make the decision. I'm happy that John 3.16 does not say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if Vernon McGee believes in him, I'm glad it doesn't say that. It might not mean me. I was in Seattle, Washington in meetings at the Olympia Hotel and the phone rang and I went. I hadn't been there for a couple hours and Somebody said, is this Vernon McGee? And I said, yes. And says, well, how are you? Woman's voice. I said, fine. Said, how is Annie? And I said, Annie? I don't know Annie. Oh, yes, your wife. I said, no, you're wrong. I'm <clears throat> I don't have a wife named Annie. She said, aren't you Vernon McGee? And I said, yes. She became very icy then. I said, yes, I'm Vernon. She says, aren't you a preacher? I said, yes. She says, weren't you pastor of a Methodist church and mentioned a place in Iowa? I said, no, ma'am, lady. I've never even been off the train in Iowa. I just look out the window and stay on the train when I go through there. I've never been in Iowa. She said to me, she said, well, I knew a Vernon McGee that was a Methodist preacher in a certain place. Well, I said, I'm sorry. She says, that's a strange thing, isn't it? Two Vernon McGees, and both of them are preachers. And I said, yes. And I said, I always think of what Mel Trotter said. Mel Trotter said once that he never met anybody. He thought there ought to be two of them. One's enough of any of them. And I said, you know, I want you, if you do get in touch with the other Vernon McGee, extend my sympathy to him. But I got to thinking about that afterward. You know, if John 3.16 had said Vernon McGee, it might have meant that other fellow, not me. But now it means me, whosoever will. And this morning, because of an act of faith of taking Christ as my Savior, I can say, chosen of the Lord. And my friend this morning, God so loved the world that 1,900 years ago he gave his Son, that you, whoever you are, whosoever, that means you personally, it means you. Don't go out of here and say, I'm not chosen. You are chosen. You are responsible today to make that decision. When you do, 
And you can say, Shout of the Lord. 